Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, my name is Christian Sinclair, and I'm with the U of A's Center for Middle Eastern Studies. And it's my privilege and honor this afternoon to introduce the next plenary speaker, uh, David Fenner. David and I met in the early 2000s in Vermont. I was the director of Middle Eastern Studies at World Learning's SIT Study Abroad. And David at the time was Assistant Vice Provost and Director of International Programs and Exchanges at the University of Washington. But he also sat on SIT Study Abroad's Advisory Council, which is how we came to meet. And I could tell from our first conversations that he had a passionate commitment to cross-cultural education and student development. His international travels began back when he was an undergraduate student and he traveled to Yugoslavia. As a graduate student, he went to the Soviet Union. I'm just noticing, David, that the countries you travel to have a habit of disintegrating after your departure. Um, anyway, he, <laughs> he went on to serve as a Peace Corps volunteer in the Sultanate of Oman, which I can say is still in existence. After these experiences, he took a job as a counselor at the University of Washington's Foreign Study Office. He then became assistant director, associate director, acting director, and finally director. Along the way, the office expanded its role to include incoming as well as outgoing students and scholars and changed its name to International Programs and Exchanges. In addition to being its director, David also became assistant vice provost for international education. He remained at UW for 24 years before resigning in 2007 to take a position with SIT World Learning that would send him back to the Sultanate of Oman as director of World Learning's center there. In an email sent out to UW announcing his resignation, David said he accepted the position at World Learning because of the organization's mission, caliber, and track record, the Omani government's enthusiasm for the program, and a compelling need to begin to repair the damage the U.S. had caused in the Middle East. It's hard to imagine that one man in, in Oman could reverse that damage, but it really shows David's vision and drive. And that's why we at the Center for Middle Eastern Studies suggested he come to this weekend's Intercultural Competence Conference as a plenary speaker. And I think after this talk, you will agree that David Fenner is truly an internationalist and an interculturalist. So please join me in welcoming David Fenner. Thank you. Uh, I'm overwhelmed by the, the warmth and generosity of that introduction. Uh, Christian is much too kind. And uh, how are we doing sound-wise? And uh, I have a, a, an undying debt of gratitude uh, to Christian for laying the the academic and the structural foundation for the center that we began in Oman in 2007. So um, I was uh, honored uh, uh, to get this invitation, but very pleased uh, to simply to be able to see Christian again. Uh, the other reason that I'm pleased to be here is that uh, I, uh, for as Christian mentioned, I for 25 or 30 years have been uh, providing administrative support for academic programs overseas and also for incoming international students and scholars. And I am embarrassed to say that this is really the first conference where I have actually rubbed shoulders with theoreticians and scholars who look at issues of cross-cultural competence and second language acquisition uh, on a uh, academic and scholarly and thoughtful and data-driven level. And this is an embarrassment for me um, because I, I feel as though there were years and years of missed opportunities when I should have been benefiting from the insights that I've been hearing these last few days from uh, theoreticians and practitioners alike, and yet I wasn't. I was out sort of inventing the bicycle, as the French say, uh, on my own, and then because I did it in 1984 one way, I did it in 1985 the, the same way, and on and on and on through some uh, three decades. This is maybe emblematic of one of the challenges that our field of, of international education has in that it isn't um, as inclusive or as outreaching as it should be. And it's, uh, it's too easy to run a program the same way this year as we did last year. So. For, for all of those reasons, I'm delighted to be here. I want to thank also the, the Circle people, uh, Kate Mackay and all of her colleagues who 
uh, have made this a wonderful uh, experience for visitors uh, and participants alike. And uh, I'm sure you'll all agree that, that uh, it is a, uh, a, a wonderful endeavor. What they asked me to do today on this uh, last full day of the conference uh, in, in what the British uh, delightfully call the digestive moment after a heavy meal, um, they, they've asked me to be a little bit more interactive and a little bit more energetic than maybe some of the other plenary speakers uh, dared to be. And so if you do get tapped for some volunteer participation in today's uh, uh, short plenary session, forgive me, first of all, and thank you for your willingness to participate. Um, I have uh, also an apology to make in that this title is really not, it has nothing to do with what we're going to do today. And that was a result, unfortunately, of, of uh, not enough early planning and thinking uh, but also the evolution of uh, the whole concept of how to, in fact, target the target language in an immersion experience, either in this country or overseas. And um, I will explain a little bit more about how that uh, evolution started and where it led, uh, and ultimately it's going to form the, the foundation of what we are all going to talk about during this next hour. Uh, my own international experience, oh, speaking of that, uh, if you get too hot, then you can take off your uh, jacket and, and <laughs> get more comfortable. Um, again, interactivity is, is going to be requiring that we be dressed appropriately, so forgive me for being informal. Uh, my own international experience started when I was 12 years old. My parents decided that they would take uh, the three kids, ages 10, 12, and 14, to Guadalajara, uh, because we'd all had a little bit of Spanish and they wanted us to have our first immersion experience. And so my uh, parents, uh, dear mother and father, who are both still with us, um, are, uh, uh, my father sort of a, an amateur linguist uh, of sorts, uh, was an interpreter during the Second World War for the French Army, and, um, and has always been dab dabbling in languages uh, ever since. And so uh, we got to the hotel in Guadalajara, and they put the three of us kids to the side of the lobby, and my folks went off to check us in, and I heard my father say to my mother, oh, this is great. Maybe I'll have a chance to use the subjunctive. <laughs> so, off they go toward the lobby. The three kids are standing <laughs> all over to the side, and it's hot, and it's sort of humid, and... Uh, and we're all looking around, my brother, sister, and I are looking around for something to drink, and as if by magic, a young waiter came with a little tray, and on it were three green goblets with salt around the top. Yeah? And so, not knowing any better, he brought them over to us, and so I had my first margarita in Guadalajara at age 12. It took a little bit of time for the, the hotel staff to understand my father's use of the subjunctive, and so it transpired that the waiter came by again, and I had my second margarita uh, of my life. I'm happy to say that I had one last night. It was delicious up on the roof. And, uh, but after two, I was literally sitting in one of the potted plants in the lobby with my arm around it, and I think having a conversation when my parents came back. And uh, it was at that moment that I knew something international would be in my future. I'm just convinced of that. I, as an undergraduate, went off to Yugoslavia uh, to try to understand self-management socialism. I knew that capitalism was heartless, and I knew that communism was bankrupt, but maybe there was some middle ground. And so about a dozen American students headed off to Yugoslavia in 1973 to try to figure out how uh, to uh, organize the world as we Americans try to do. And um, I uh, uh, went, stopped in Berlin on the way, and uh, within four hours, I think, I had lost my passport and all of my documents, and uh, we happened to be on the eastern side of Berlin, and so I spent the first four or five days of my European experience as the guest of the East German government. Miraculously, somebody uh, turned all of my documents in that had fallen out of my jacket in a park, and I was able to rejoin the group of students in Vienna, 
We took the train down through uh, Slovenia and Croatia, then part of Yugoslavia, uh, and into Belgrade, where for uh, the, the 12 of us students, there were 11 host families waiting with their photographs of their student. Well, of course, nobody was there for me. So all the other students departed with their host families, and I sat down on my suitcase in the train station in Belgrade, and a little tear came down my eye, my cheek. And uh, I didn't know what to do. I was 19 years old. I, the only place I'd ever been was Mexico. I sort of looked around to see if someone would bring me a drink. And, um, and I finally made my way to the University of Belgrade to try to uh, find out where my host family was, and I found uh, uh, Professor Abramovich, who was our, our mentor, and he said, not to worry, don't worry, don't worry, he said, we'll find you family. So um, uh, they did, in fact, find me a family, but the way they did it was special. They actually put me in a dormitory, which was fine for a while, uh, but then they advertised on the radio. Um, <laughs> And it went something like this, does anyone want American boy? <laughs> and so after two or three days, somebody called up uh, the Vukoicic family, and I went out to, uh, uh, on the tram, number nine, all the way out through Beograd and met up with the family, and I was supposed to stay with them for the first six weeks of the program. Uh, I stayed for six months, and it was just a remarkable experience, um, soup to nuts, uh, uh, changed my life, changed who I am. Uh, but there's another little linguistic component to my initial introduction to the family, and that was the father in the family was a journalist with Politica, um, and he um, had some English, but not very much. And for some reason, somehow, miraculously again, uh, it was the pronouns that he always got wrong. And so you could never tell who was going to be doing what to whom uh, in his sentences. But as I remember getting off the tram and bringing my suitcases over to the, the house and knocking on the door, the door opened, and there's the father, his mother, the grandmother, and his two college-age children, uh, Slavoljub, the young man, and Slajana, uh, the young woman, who happened to be the most beautiful woman I had ever seen. This was going to be my host family. And the father motioned generally to his kids, and he said, and you, David, will sleep with her, <laughs> him. And I, I, in between the her and the him, I, I mentioned something about Yugoslav uh, hospitality, and, <laughs> and, and, and that was the beginning of a wonderful relationship and a friendship um, with that family. Every morning I got up and I asked the grandmother, who slept literally over the oven in the kitchen, up on a little ledge, I asked her how she slept that, the night before. Kako vispali babushka. And she would smile, a little endearing smile, and say, dobro, dobro. And it was only at the end of my six months there that Slavoljub, the son, said to me, you know, David, when you ask granny how she slept, she thinks you are asking about her hubcaps. My pronunciation was so bad that she thought I was asking, how are your hubcaps? So years later, when I got letters from them, they would always end it with, and Granny says her hubcaps are fine. <laughs> so that's all by way of introduction, and I'm going to motor ahead now to this actual talk. But before I did that, I wanted to, um, I wanted to, to, Focus a little bit on Swahili. So I thought at a language and culture conference, if I got away without teaching a little bit of language while I, while I was here, and pardon the audiolingual method here, but if you all could repeat after me, Samaki, you know, that was pretty good, but pretend you're in the shower and that you're all by yourself and you're not, um, there isn't anybody else here. And I really need you to be bold. Language learners have to be bold, as you know. Samaki. Mkunje. Mkunje. Angali. Mbichi. Samaki. Mkunje. Angali. Mbichi. I just love this. Uh, it's a wonderful uh, Swahili saying from East Africa, and it's, bend the fish while it is still moist. 
Huh? Huh? This is really good advice. Um, and it's make hay while the sun shines. It's a strike while the iron is hot. It is carpe diem, carp samaki. You, you, figure, you figure out what the connections are here. Um, in its actual Swahili, as was Tarzan's uh, uh, Ngawa. Remember when Tarzan used to say Ngawa in movies and the, the rogue elephant would turn on its heel and run in the other direction? Uh, Ngawa actually does mean something in Swahili. It means although. <laughs> See, an elephant having a kind of a epistemological crisis when, when Tarzan would say, of course, he would run off. But... Um, we are going to talk about bending the fish while it is still moist in the context of orientation of students. And it occurred to me, as I was thinking about this talk and thinking about my years of experience, that we really need to do a better job of getting our students off on the right foot. And it may be increasingly important with this millennial generation of American students who go overseas because there is a growing sense of entitlement about this generation. And I know you're all nodding your heads. Um, they all get a trophy in their soccer tournament, right? Whether they've lost, uh, won, or drawn. They all want A's no matter how well they did in, in our classes. Um, and it seems to me that we really need to re-empower and re-enable our students through a kind of re-engineered and re-calibrated um, orientation. I recognize that orientations are thankless experiences. They are no win for the organizers. Students hate them, and they don't listen. So I've been trying to think of those components of orientations that I've run over the years that are in fact, have in fact, effective components to them. That they aren't all just sort of Ten Commandment, Old Testament patriarchs talking to students, don't drink, don't miss class, don't, I'm trying to sound like an Old Testament guy, don't, don't uh, uh, disrespect the local community, don't dress immodestly, all those don't, 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 that students don't hear and they don't incorporate. So I'm thinking that there's got to be a way that we can, as, um, as Michael Jordan once said to Gary Payton, Michael Jordan veteran Gary Payton rookie, uh, Gary Payton used to trash talk a lot on the court, and Michael Jordan finally took him aside, put his arm around him and said, uh, Gary, don't get in their face get in their head. That's what I want to do with these students. I want to get them to a point where they recognize that they are the only people who can really target the target language. We can do a lot pedagogically, we can do a lot curricularly, we can do a lot in terms of, of whom we hire as teachers, but unless the student, her or himself, is really motivated and really empowered to be an active language learner, I don't think we'll succeed. So when I first sent this slide around to the circle people, somebody wrote back to me and said, oh, David, we found a mistake in your slide presentation. There's nothing written under orientation. Yes, that's the point. I want, I want you to take this blank slate and fill it in with some ideas maybe that I come up with from my experience, but also I'd love to hear about what components of your own orientations have helped you create really active student learners. In my experience, for this particular generation, uh, I think more so than before, there's a kind of spatial reality that they live in. There's a relational reality that they live in. And there is a, a need, I think, for some kind of a structure to put their experiences into. And so what I've done with some 30-year-old uh, or 50-year-old images that talk about culture and talk about culture shock, I've simplified them into something that a student can take with her or him all throughout their experiences and remember what in the world uh, the orienteers were talking about at the beginning 
Um, I, I, I got to remember to tell you, though, that my first orientation in 1982 or three at the University of Washington was uh, to me, the Foreign Study Office, orienting the outbound English department poetry majors. And um, after I sort of did the old, old Testament thing to them all, they filled out an evaluation of the orientation. And while the one line I will always remember was uh, somebody wrote, um, David Fenner is a power-hungry pseudo-graduate student courted by incapacity. I refuse to ever go to the English department again after that. How dare they really quote William Blake at me like that. Um, so I wanted to figure out a way to give students something that really was useful, but without doing it in a kind of patronizing, I know the answer and you don't way. And so I came up with some pretty simplistic and simplified images that I share with all students in my orientations. So I say to them, what is this? And they, in a participatory and interactive kind of way, say, a triangle, sort of, a mountain, and what's the German word for mountain? Berg, and what's a really cold mountain you find in the ocean? Iceberg, uh-huh. So, I once gave an orientation at the dental school, and I did this to them, and they said, tooth, <laughs> yeah, yeah, and gum line, and it actually works as an image. In fact, you can use this in any talk on any topic. It turns out that almost all problems in dentistry occur below the gum line, and that is true of the iceberg of culture as well. So. Students, for some reason, remember this uh, as time goes by because I add little features to it that they, that they won't forget. One of them is the Titanic. So I say that they come into this iceberg of culture environment all like students, and they're on board the Titanic, and then I just sort of let that go. And then we talk a little bit about what happens to the Titanic and below the waterline as um, they start to recognize that there is more to culture than just what meets the eye. There is a what component. Again, excuse me for this being so simplistic and non-scholarly, but it is uh, something that seems to stick with students. There is a what component to the iceberg of culture, a how component, and a why component. And if you could figure out what's above the waterline that they can see, that tourist experience that we talked about earlier in one of the sessions this morning, if you can figure out there, there are buildings and there's clothing and there's food and there's language, and then figure out how to get below the waterline and try to figure out how those components of culture interrelate and how they interact with one another, and then to get even further down into the why aspects what makes this place tick? What is the dominant value in this culture? And that's where so many students run aground and then develop a kind of a culture shock that we're going to talk about in a minute. But you can imagine that if they see a mosque, I have one of those magic things here. If they see a mosque out here, and then they learn that everyone prays five times a day and are mostly Muslims and the men go to the mosque and the women don't, they pray at home. And then you get down here and start to talk about the dominant values of that society that include, of course, God and uh, Muhammad, the, the prophet, peace be upon him, and uh, the different values that are inherent in Islam. You can start to understand how students will have and expect to have difficulty as they get down here when their own set of deeply held values bumps into, runs aground against those of the host culture. And this is simple, but they start to recognize that if the dominant culture in uh, a, a dominant value in one culture down here is harmony, and in another, it's competition. If the dominant value down here in another culture is the collective, the we, 
And in their culture, it is the individual, the I. If they get down here and they discover that the dominant value in one culture is Allah, and in their culture it's the dollar sign, then you start to be able to show students that they are in fact going to have some challenges as they get linguistically better able to get from just looking at things like a tourist down into the aspects of culture. Absolutely um, unscientific culture shock horseshoe. Yeah, we used to use the W, but then George Bush was elected and we didn't do that anymore. So I think we were playing University of Miami this, this year too. So um, I, this is the kind of thing that I use with students to help them see that they are about to have um, an experience that is uh, rough and tumble in many ways and that also has a, a really linear connection to how they're developing linguistically. And so we talk in, in just general terms about how they're on the upswing when they first get to the country and things are really neat and they're excited and they're, they're optimistic. And then as they get deeper and deeper into the culture, they start going down into this trough of, of uh, despair and, and it can be pretty bad down there. And uh, one of the things I've noticed over the years is that there is a, a, a line, a dotted line across this horseshoe that has to do with where you have a sense of humor and where you don't. Down here, nothing is funny. Absolutely nothing is funny. And you really need to re go through this trough and then come back out the other side in order for life to regain a kind of, of uh, joie that you probably went into it with. But I want to talk particularly about this trough down here, the red zone, um, as, as a, a time that is really complicated in, in linguistic terms because it's a time when most students are not making progress toward their um, toward, toward their goals. They may very well be, be making progress, but they don't think they are. They are really dissatisfied with their ability to use in, in Russian the, the verbs of motion are extraordinarily complicated. You have to know whether you're going or coming. You have to know whether it's repeated action or single action. And, and students just fall into this morass of despair with the verbs of motion in Russia. I've been in this trough trying to tackle those verbs along with everybody else, and, uh, and at just the right moment, le moment juste, I got a kind of a pick-me-up package from my mother. Uh, it was my birthday, and, uh, and I really needed this pick-me-up package, and it was a little box, and in it was a card, and the card said, Dear David, uh, I've baked you a batch of your favorite chocolate chip cookies, and I've sent them all the way to Leningrad, and uh, I've put one in the box for each year of your sweet life. And I opened the box with alacrity, and there in the box were five cookies. On the side of the box was a stamp that said, Inspected by Soviet Postal Officials. They'd eaten my cookies. <laughs> I was just completely devastated by that. And I knew the Soviet Union was doomed at that point. I thought I couldn't get any lower and that things couldn't get any worse. And then right here, I got a letter from my girlfriend back in America, Darlene. Dear David, do you remember I love this name, Lance Savage. Some kind of fictitious philanderer gets, uh, steals my girlfriend in the middle of my despair. I'm getting a dear, you know, Ivan letter in the Soviet Union, and I'm just miserable. And my attitude just goes straight to hell. And it was just awful. Until, right about here, the director of the uh, dormitory, Objezhitya Nr. Shist, the director uh, came to us and he said, I have terrible news for you. We have run out of Leningradskoye Industrialnoye Piva. 
Leningrad industrial beer. It was just awful, you know? And we said, oh. And he said, we have to replace it with this Czech stuff, Pilsner something, Pilsner Urk, Urk, Urk something. And so they were providing these Pilsner Urkwell to the whole dormitory after that, and that helped to lubricate my, <laughs> my um, experience right at that important moment. The other thing that happened was I met Natasha. Natasha was a gem, was a saint, was a queen, was a, a wonderful language partner. And I started to recognize that with a little lubrication from the Czechs and with a, a lot of motivation from Natasha, who didn't speak a word of English, that I started to come up out of the trough and things got better fast. Of course, then I got home and there was no Natasha, and I went back down. I had the reverse culture shock kind of experience. But having passed through the trough taught me a lot, culturally, linguistically, socially, psychologically, personally, and I was simply a better, broader, deeper human being after that experience even though I'm not sure you could have quantified that in any way uh, using even modern uh, techniques. What I tell students in an orientation, what I, the message I try to convey is that if they can do six or seven really critical things, they too can make the maximum advantage take the mass, maximum advantage of this experience studying overseas. And over my uh, experience, over my years of experience in Oman and in uh, the United States and in the Soviet Union and in Yugoslavia and in Mexico, uh, I discovered that they are pretty simple to put down what these seven or eight things are. I won't, you, can, you, you all recognize probably what they are before I put them up there, but uh, they all provide a kind of outward bound uh, impetus to students in their learning. <laughs> Appropriate is an important word there. This is number four is critical. And of course, you knew this was coming. <laughs> Easy to remember how everybody can have her or his own Natasha. If they just do these things, it helps get them through the trough. Now, with time running ever shorter, now I need some volunteers. First one, I need to come to the restaurant. Would you please come? Please, won't you have a seat in the restaurant? And maybe take a look at our menu. And now I need about five volunteers over on this side of the bright lights. Don't be bashful. Don't be bashful. Come, 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 come. Don't be bashful. There are bashful people? <laughs> good, good, good. Excellent. Right about here. So we are still on camera. Now bunch up a little bit. Excellent. Bravo. Now I need one more volunteer language student. Okay. Excuse me, tell me your name. Amber, perfect. Amber, you're a student on an Arabic language program in the Sultanate of Oman on the Arabian Peninsula on the Arabian Gulf. You're, Carla, you're a student on the very same program. And you've just come to the restaurant and you're going to say, I'll have the Arabic language program, please. She's just ordered the Arabic language program. Now, Amber, on the other hand, has just learned what a cucumber is in Arabic. And Amber, you're, you're a star of this show. And you have learned that the word in Arabic for cucumber is khiyar, 
And khiyar comes from the same root as choice. So we talked about choice yesterday in one of the plenary or the keynote sessions about moments that students can make choices. And so now Amber is decided not to go to the restaurant and order the Arabic language program. She's going to go where? To the souk, to the market. She's going to go to the market because her language teacher has said, you know, Amber, you can get cucumbers at the market. So she's going to go to the market and buy the cucumber. You can do it in any language. Khiyar. Ah, good. <laughs> oh, this is an expensive cucumber. I love this. How did I get, how did I know? I have a teacher too. Taban. <laughs> Okay, good. So he now, hey, she has just met uh, uh, the man in the souk uh, who sells the cucumbers. And guess what? His brother lives in a village where they grow the cucumbers. And he says to Amber, you know, if you wanted, maybe you'd like to go out to Ebri where they have a whole field of cucumbers, and you could meet my brother and his family and my mother and my cousin. So Amber goes out to Ibri and meets the brother and meets the whole family. And Zayk, how are you? He I'm says. Lay. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. She, <laughs> he's just transported us to Egypt, which is fine. <laughs> it's a long way to get cucumbers. And then, but guess what? His his sister is going to be married the next day. And he says to Amber, as all Arabs will do, why don't you come to my sister's wedding? So Amber goes to, yeah, sit, and she is going to get a whole bunch of what? Intercultural, linguistic, social, and fun under her belt by doing this. Now, hang on just a second. Freeze action over here. Going to go back to see Carla. Excuse me. I ordered the... Arabic language program. Amber, you're still going. Now, it turns out that, that the sister who just got married is going to have a really big party that night, and she wants her sister to henna Amber up and paint her with that wonderful stuff that they women use in the Arab world uh, to make themselves look even more beautiful. So Amber gets to go to a henna party over here, and she's learning the word for henna, the word for design, the word for virtually all of this. They're doing her nails, X, the whole thing is just working fine. And then uh, let's go back to the restaurant where Miss Passivity is still waiting for something to happen. And she finally says... This is a lousy program. Thank you, volunteers. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hard as that may be to believe, a whole bunch of pretty well-prepared, healthy, once curious people, get off airplanes all over the world for intensive language programs, and a whole heap of them are just like Carla. <laughs> they sit here and they wait for an Arabic language program to happen to them. They wait for the verbs of motion to be taught for, to them. They wait for uh, osmosis to occur. And what the message I always try to send to students is, they don't have to make that choice, that ikhtiar. They can do what Amber did, and they can get out into the environment, use their language, develop a much deeper appreciation of where they are, of who they are, of how they are in, in this world, and make some really lifelong, meaningful interconnections with people and make some fabulous linguistic progress. Carla didn't really make much, but she certainly did make a judgment. I couldn't let this go. This, you probably know about this. This is a statue, actually. These are statues um, by a sculptor named Dwayne Hansen. I think they're, I don't know where they are now. The originals were in Stockholm, and it was entitled American Tourists. Yeah? And these people are just standing there in an art museum, and 
stand, I walked by them and said, excuse me, once, uh, when I first saw them. And, um, and they are just amazing, but they are the perfect um, illustration of w what image we Americans used to have 30 years ago when you asked the rest of the world what they thought when they saw when they thought of an American, particularly an American tourist. What came to mind when we said the U.S.? I put this in here because it's, it's not um, your father's Oldsmobile anymore. Uh, this isn't the image we're having to deal with in the world's mind. There are other, much more complicated images. This is certainly one of them, particularly in the Arab world. Couple that with this, Lady Gaga wearing meat. <laughs> These are images that come to the rest of the world's mind when we design orientations that are designed to, to prepare our students for where they're going and the, and the reception that they get. One of the things I like to try to do, started out a different way than it, it ended up, and that was, um, I, I used to think that I knew what made a, 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 an ideal student who was on a, an intensive language program overseas. And so what I would do is I would type, typed all these things out, and then I would share them with students early on in their programs overseas and say, you can uh, judge yourself relative to this. And then a very wise colleague of mine said, David, you're a power-hungry pseudo-graduate student courted by incapacity. <laughs> and I wondered how that got out, but I must have shared that with him <laughs> earlier. And I said, well, what do you mean? And he said, let them come up with the ideal student profile. So I'm going to give you all one minute to come up with the ideal student profile. What do you want to see from a student on an overseas program? And I'll repeat it for our remote listeners. Oh, raise your hand, and then I'll, I'll see who you are. Open-minded, good. Flexible, curious, patient, asking questions, huh? Tolerant, excellent, good, tolerant. Flexible again, even doubly flexible, uh-huh, yeah. Sense of humor critical. Observant, good. Reflective. See, these are, keep them up. I mean, you can think of, and you are the Swahili students here, you can think of a hundred things that would make you better students of Swahili. You can put them into a profile like this if you're a program coordinator, and then sort of remind students along the way, how ask them, them to, to judge how well they stack up against this ideal student profile that they helped to build at the beginning. Again, helping them develop a sense of agency, a sense of responsibility for their own language program is really the key here. Um, I've got to finish, but I've got just one more thing to do, I think. Oh, I've got to introduce you quickly to Leila Bint Kanadish Al Harsusi. Leila is, uh, she's probably about 35 now, this was a long time ago, uh, and uh, she uh, is a Bedouin who lived in the central a desert of Oman, and her father, Kanadish, was one of our colleagues as we were working on a United Nations development project there. And he taught me, Kanadish taught me three things. Um, and, and it's sort of the, the motto of how a, uh, a Bedouin lives and how a Bedouin survives in a very difficult environment. And I thought these are things that also uh, would help us as learners of language and culture also to be uh, more effective, more efficient at what we're doing. Kanadish said, be quick to wonder, slow to judge, and keen to discover. Please repeat after me. Samaki, Mkunje, Angali, Mbichi. Thank you very much.